Scott Bakula, codename Mr. Smith. He's a spy. That term is so out. Maria Bello, codename Mrs. Smith. She's an assassin. I'm not an assassin. She's lying. Their marriage may be only a cover. We're just starting to click. But CBS next. You call this clicking? Call them Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Theorizing that podcast audiences wanted to listen to two grown men talk about time travel, Nate Bowden and Brian Martin started a show dedicated to Quantum Leap. Together, they explore NBC's revival of the franchise, starring Raymond Lee and Caitlin Bassett, and its connections to the original series. They also examine spin-offs, such as novels and comics, as well as some mirror images in the form of television shows and movies that share creative DNA with the adventures of Sam Beckett and Ben Song. And so Nate and Brian find themselves leaping from topic to topic, striving to make sense of it all, and hoping each time that their next episode will be the one that goes viral. Oh boy, it's a Quantum Leap podcast. My name is Nate, and if he were a spy, I'm sure he'd tell me it's Brian Martin. No, you wouldn't know until it was too late. Oh, <laughs> <Oof. laughs> okay. <laughs> In fact, the spy show that we're on is called Too Little, Too Nate. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good start. That's great. On that note, I think I'm going to pop open the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> because I have to take the blame for this. This was your idea, yes. This was my was. idea, and... Well, I mean, we'll get into it, but... It's not even one of those franchises. It's just one of those titles, right? Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Right. What are you going to do with this title? It's just two nondescript, possibly married, maybe not people. And the implication is that there's going to be loads of sexual tension. That's the implication, at least. I think at least three of the things titled Mr. and Mrs. Smith have delivered on that. <laughs> right. Well... So this is my first question, was how did you come across this, and had you heard of it before? Well, it just popped up in my news feed the way internet does. At the time that that came up, the Amazon show was just premiering. And I thought, well, this is apropos. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Good sure. timing. Because if you remember at the time, I was thinking the show wasn't coming back until March. And I thought, right, we and now we're done that. with yeah, the season. <laughs> exactly. We were planning on this like a month and a half ago. Right. When we thought the show was still going to be on hiatus, waiting to come back for the second half of its second season. Exactly. So this kind of got punted. I was thinking at the time, oh, well, just from this article headline, that Mr. and Mrs. Smith must go back further than that 2005 movie everybody's heard of. Sure. And yeah. that it must be some kind of property that has. Deeper roots than I'm aware of. Turns out, no. <laughs> it's just a very simple, provocative title yeah. that can be about virtually anything. So the history of the concept or the title of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I think the earliest thing with this title was a 1941 movie directed by Alfred Hitchcock, mm -hmm. of all people. The only straight-up comedy that he ever directed like he had some dark comedies later on, like The Trouble with Harry, but this is the only one that was just screwball comedy right? about a married couple. This movie is not about spies, and I think most modern audiences associate Mr. and Mrs. Smith with spies. Like, start, it's spies. Right. Maybe they're married, I, maybe they're not, but there's definitely spies. Yeah, I think if anybody knows anything about Mr. and Mrs. Smith, they're thinking about the Angelina Jolie Brad Pitt movie from 2005. Sure, which right? was a... Uh, I would think that's the most popular. Which was a spec script written by Simon Kinberg. So mm -hmm. it wasn't based on anything. He wrote it when he was still studying in school and then sold the script. Doug Lyman directed the movie, famously starred Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, even though that story is just bananas. Yeah. In terms of who was attached and who wasn't. And the only thing I can tell you about the 2005 Mr. and Mrs. Smith is that I watched it when I was still working at a movie theater. And we were screening it the night before it opened. I watched three quarters of the movie and got called away. I had to go take a phone call or deal with something. I did not make it back into the auditorium before it came out. And now up to that point, I was kind of feeling it. I was like, this is pretty good. I'm in it. 
Mm -hmm. Every single one of my coworkers who came out of that movie at the end of it said, it screwed the pooch. They blew the ending. God, that sucked. Really? I have never gone back to it. I don't know how the movie ends. I don't know what happens in that third act, but I was like, well, I guess we'll call it a day. Well, can I spoil it? Spoilers for a 2005 movie, folks, if you haven't seen it. This movie ends in a Butch and Sundance kind of situation where they basically go charging into gunfire, and it ends. Butch and Sundance is the one where they come yeah, out of that they Mexican kick the doors village open of a South American they, village. And it just ends, yeah. right? Great and ending just, for Butch and Sundance. It makes total sense for them. Right. And here they just kind of go back to back and they say, it's okay, well, we're together now and we're a unit and we're against the world. And then they kick open some doors and they're fighting against their two rival companies. And then that's it. There's no ending. It doesn't so end. So they're dead. <laughs> I guess I mean, if that's how it ends to you, Brian, then for sure. But I mean, that's it. I would have to watch it, and I probably won't. So yeah, I think it's like a fade to black situation. Honestly, oof. God, so yeah, what? that was one of the first times I really remember thinking, "Well, I could have done better than that." <laughs> <laughs> I can't even really fully express the level of disappointment that was just resonating for people coming out of that theater at the end of it. What happened? What could have possibly happened? No one would tell me what happened. It's cuz there's but they nothing were all to just tell. like they're like I don't even want to talk about it. And I was like the movie was going so well. Yeah. I you know <laughs> what could have possibly gone wrong? After you know however many years what is it 20 some years later now. Mhm. It's still a good time. I mean, the three quarters of the movie where they are just Brad pitting it up, you know? Yeah. And just, well, we still remember it, Yeah, obviously, because, I mean, the new series with Donald Glover and Maya Erskine is at least inspired in part by it, I think. Yes. But we're not talking about any of these. Which is unfortunate, because I watched the first episode of the Amazon series Okay. after watching our Scott Bakula-led oh. version. And, uh... I'm going to guess you enjoyed the Scott Bakula one more. <laughs> no, uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, but my point is that there's nothing better than watching the pilot for a failed TV series, is there, folks? <laughs> <laughs> We've talked on here about some shows that didn't really have staying power or legs that were really, really good right. and had great pilots. But I'm not sure this is one of them. This is for the Scott Bakula completists yeah, out there. I think so. And we've watched two pilots for the podcast. Right. We watched the Sliders pilot. Sliders. And we watched the Highway to Heaven pilot. Both of which got like five seasons. Oh, orders, man. Right? And both of them knocked it out of the park in both my Both of them are great, great pilots. Like all-timer pilots. Like very, great, great pilot episodes. Very good. Very good. And... Tonight we're watching the pilot, I guess it would have been the follow-up series, because this was 1996. So this is like, I guess, three years after Quantum Leap is done. The first episode aired on September 20th of 1996. The last aired episode in the U.S. was on November 8th of 1996. So this shit didn't even make it two months (laughs) before it got canned. It aired nine out of 13 episodes on US TV, and then they pulled the plug on it. I think the full seasons ran in like, Poland, (laughs) some like Eastern Bloc country. (laughs) And if you're wondering where we watched it, folks, it's available on YouTube. Yeah. And and the coolest thing. 13 episodes. The coolest thing, at least about the pilot episode, is that it it was uploaded to YouTube based on a VHS scan. Uh, (laughs) So you get the crinkle effect. Really feels like I recorded this and was just watching it in my room as like a 16 year old. It's got the little like. Action 5 news thing in the corner. Yep, yep, <laughs> you know? yep. It's kind of great in that respect. It makes you feel like you found a gem watching it that way. You know, yeah. not <laughs> yeah. in the sense that, oh, I've uncovered this thing that nobody knew about. And there's probably a reason nobody's heard of it. That's the crazy thing, okay? Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty steeped in pop culture. I was like, how did I not know this show existed for two months? Right. Well, I know why. The answer is because it was on CBS. <laughs> <laughs> My grandparents were probably aware of it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it was Scott Bakula's Quantum Leap follow-up. And somehow, Mr. I and Mrs. Smith. never heard of this. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, produced by Scott Bakula's production company. 
Yeah, he was all in on this. He went all in on it, and that is very interesting to me. The pilot episode, of course, concerns a man and a woman. They are both spy-adjacent kind of people. Scott Bakula plays Mr. Smith, and the Mrs. Smith is portrayed by Maria Bello. Mm -hmm. Delightful to see her in this show. And of everyone in the cast, Maria Bello seems like the only one who should be there. She, to me, seems the entire time like, this is a good role for her. Oh, okay. Oh, I okay, cannot yeah. say that about a single other person on the show. <laughs> okay. I got somebody I might mention later on. <laughs> I'm sure you do. And I was feeling it early on. And then as the show wore on, I was like, no, nope, I don't believe I do. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers ahead of time here. So the show was conceived of by Carrie Lenhart and John J. Sackmar. This pilot episode was written by the two of them. Good luck finding anything else they've done. Um. <laughs> Strange Luck. You remember that series, Strange oh, Luck? wow, I do remember that. Yeah, that was theirs. They actually have been writers on a host of shows that you probably okay. have heard of. In looking at it on IMDb, Mr. and Mrs. Smith is one of the things they're listed as being known for. <laughs> Woof. See, that's what I'm saying. Like, good luck. Yeah, that being said, Strange though, luck I, I heard of. Though. They were producers on Boston Public. Ah, Boston Public, I remember. Right. Most of these things are like executive producer, consulting producer, Psych from USA. Sure. The Glades. That's a popular one. I've the heard Glades, of. The okay. Know that. <laughs> judging Amy... Oh, wow. uh, early edition consulting producer. Oh, shit. Well, that's one we're probably going to watch at some point. Yeah, so we, we might should see get more there for of, that. So, more of the work of Carrie Lynn Hart and John Jay Sequest 2032. And. Oh, I thought we were talking about C Lab from Adult Swim there for a second. <laughs> no, Sequest. Like, yeah, Sequest is a little different. <laughs> Sequest is the one with a dolphin in the submarine. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's right. But here's the kicker because I did look this up and now I remember. Their first credit is a TV movie called Out of Time, and it is a cop from the future goes Ooh. back in time to Los Angeles and teams up with his great-grandfather to capture a master criminal. Sounds great. I'm sold. Just <laughs> put it in front of my eyes and I'll watch it. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm good there. Yes. I'm going to dig it out. I'll watch that shit. <laughs> yeah, that sounds terrific. <laughs> So Carrie Lenhart and John J. Sackmar actually have uh, some, some... I wouldn't call it pedigree exactly, but, you know. But similarly, the director of this episode, David S. Jackson, has directed episodes of Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, Nash Bridges, Dark Angel, remember that one? Yeah. Uh, Smallville. Hey, there you go. One Tree Hill, directed episodes of Miami Vice. He's been around. He yeah. made the rounds through Hollywood. It definitely sounds like some TV journeyman. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then you've got Scott Bakula, Maria Bello, and the two main roles. It sounds like it should have been successful. <laughs> yeah, but there's plenty going wrong for it, too. Uh, uh, from from the word go, almost. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you want to give it a breakdown as a where did Scott Bakula leap himself? Where did, where did Scott Bakula find himself? Well, the show opens... With Scott Bakula cleaning the floor of an office building, Thermocore Laboratories, he's like the night janitor, he's buffing the floors. It really reminded me immediately of that Always Sunny in Philadelphia episode we watched where he was the janitor of a nursing home. <laughs> what are the rules? What are the rules? What are the rules? You know, that whole thing. Right. I, I thought about that really quick, but... He is kind of sneaking through these hallways to boost some sensitive information about a power source that could revolutionize American energy. The mission is simple. You are to locate the missing scientist. You maintain the same identity, Mr. Smith. Right. He works for an agency called The Factory. His boss is named Mr. Big, and ladies, it's not the same Mr. Big. I just want to get that out of the way. Don't get excited. Totally different guy. Not hot. <laughs> That's presumptuous of you to say, Brian. I... Oh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure he's not very hot. But uh... 
<laughs> uh, Scott Bakula looking great. Yeah, he's supposed to be the throughout. hot one in this show for sure. The mission statement of the factory is that they are protecting the interests of corporate America. Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, boy. Uh, I think you probably got this one in right under the wire in terms of it being non-viable as a mission statement <laughs> on yeah. a primetime drama series. This Seriously. is not, not a good look, Scott. Not a good look. But his mission here brings him into direct, I don't even want to say conflict, encounters yeah. with another spy portrayed by Maria Bello. When they first run across each other in that laboratory did you think they already knew each other? No. Did you get the impression they had met before? No. I kind of felt like they did for a second. Someone else was on the job ahead of me. You know, we told you this is on YouTube. It takes 40 minutes. Go check this thing out and come back and listen to it with us. It's, I mean, it's definitely a, a, one of those weird mid-90s oddities of television. Like, and I don't even know if the super spy genre was very popular in the mid-90s. What is it? David E. Kelly had that Snoops show around oh, the same right. time. you're right, Snoops. Mission Impossible was 96. 96 was Mission Impossible. GoldenEye was like 95. I guess there's like a spy resurgence. The problem with spy stories in the mid-90s is that we didn't know who we were against. We weren't against anybody in the 90s. And that's what was so cool about Mission Impossible. Yeah, it's like yeah, well, they kind of yeah. they kind of laid that out. <laughs> that's that's the whole The Cold War is over. Yeah. I'm antiquated now. Yeah. And I guess that's maybe why they made them corporate raiders instead of international secret spies. I, you I, know, I guess. That I guess and maybe it's... the budget that it came with just shooting in Seattle. <laughs> They're not going anywhere else but Seattle. So I don't know why this was such a big hit in Eastern Europe, but hey, there we are. When they meet, they meet in an office adjacent from the hallway. Like, he ducks in there to get away from the security guard. Yeah. And... He hears the click of a gun, and he turns around with his gun immediately. And I'm like, well, that was kind of <laughs> quick on the handle for both of you there. Yeah. From her perspective, unless she's already aware of something, the janitor just ducked into the room, and she pulled a gun on him. Right. So she must have already been aware that he was doing something. Otherwise, her actions make no sense. And... Well, that's the, that's the whole thing. Like, either you two know the score with each other, or you don't, and this is extraordinarily weird. Yeah. Uh, right? Like, it, it's just like, oh, geez, I'm sorry, ma'am. That, <laughs> yeah, that whole scene plays very awkward. And the show also does a thing, which is unfortunately imperative, which is in order for the woman to be equal to the man... She's got to be like 10 times better because if she was as mm -hmm. equal as he is, then she's going to seem lesser. And it's just kind of the way things are perceived. And it kind of sucks. But she makes it look very, very easy. She's always a step ahead of him. And I feel like that's often the case in these types of things. Yeah. I also think there's a problem here because Maria Bello is able to navigate this role pretty easily. And I'm not sure I buy Scott Bakula in this role at all from the launch. No, I'm sorry to say. He does not seem like that sort of brash, confident person that you would have to be to make a career out of this espionage thing, right? right? And maybe I'm reading into it. Maybe I'm looking at it. Quantum Leap prepared me for him to be a perpetual fish out of water that has to kind of find his way around. And I think there's potential for that in this series in that he has to take on different roles in this sort of espionage kind of way. But at the end of the day, you expect a skilled spy to be able to adapt more easily than Bakula does as Sam Beckett into whatever role he's in. There's going to be a lot yeah, of less yeah. like klutziness yeah. And a lot of that Sam Beckett style klutziness and feeling his way through things is very present yeah. in this show. I like to see him stretch his legs a bit in a different sort of role. But because of the sort of built in expectations that come with super spy versus man out of time. Yeah. He doesn't really fit it. It doesn't quite click. Yeah. God well, love him. He's, Scott Bakula is Scott Bakula. Right. 
That's what I was going to say. I feel like in watching this, it kind of pick out what of Sam Beckett is Scott Bakula, because there are yeah. things in there that cross over. Yes. From the way that he moves and runs, his kind of soft stuttering here and there. But but what if she created that history for herself? You know, a, a false identity. We, we do it all the time. It really does feel like he's Sam Beckett sometimes. And I think that's either Scott Bakula naturally showing through or the remnants of I did this for like five years. <laughs> and this yeah, maybe is what television is. Maybe that's what it is. But I think of the other major role that Scott Bakula is known for to us. Necessary roughness. I was thinking Captain Archer on Star Trek <laughs> Enterprise, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, Captain Archer is another character that I think is... I think it's more aligned with the sort of confidence that he should be showing in this role on Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I agree. But it still has that degree of folksiness. Yeah, I think it's that trying Sam to be has. it's trying to be playfulness because he's got to be coy with this woman and it's a will they won't they. So he's got to be kind of It's a spoilers they will and it will happen in act 2. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Maria Bello just oozes sex appeal the entire episode. She's just a very but attractive woman. But somehow it's woman. not steamy with them, though. It's not steamy with them. No, it's very clowny with them. Yeah. She is great. I think Maria Bello, just by herself, is precisely what they want out of that role. Probably, yeah. But her and Bakula just don't have the chemistry. And it becomes really awkward. And it's on his <laughs> part, too, unfortunately. You know, I'm it a is. Scott Bakula it fan. Is. We're all Bakula fans here, but... He's just not pulling off that leading man role. Yeah. I really do think it's because he's trying to be playful. Yes. But playful comes off as kind of a little inept. Yeah. A little bit. I don't know. The whole thing is just a strange concoction of different feelings. It's got and this. vignettes. It's like it, yeah. strange is the word for it. It's Absolutely. Got... This is a very strange pilot. Yeah. It's got this weird art deco font. When it starts, the credits... That fits with nothing Yeah, in the it doesn't episode. fit with anything. What are you selling here? Because in the, and the score that goes with it, none of the music seems to match with the scene that they're trying to do. The it one matches with, with the font. Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> like, the music matches the font A little most bit, of the yeah. time. Yeah, but in this scene that we're talking about where they are first introduced and they've got their guns trained on one another and then it's supposed to be kind of this sultry okay in order to get past the security guard we have to pretend like we're having sex in the office because it's risque and it's the 90s on cbs right and right. it's about as tame as you could possibly imagine I would bet my bottom dollar that the character of Mr. Smith on this show is directly inspired by Roger Thornhill from North by Northwest. Okay. I 100% think that Cary Grant's character in North by Northwest is what they aped for the Mr. Smith character. Because he was a man out of place in this weird sort of espionage story, out of his depth, but charming throughout came across like a guy who was capable despite how out of his depth he was. And I really think that's what they were going for with this. Hmm. But uh, I it mean, just that's doesn't... plausible, for sure. Work. But yeah, so this opening, it's supposed to be tense and hot and sultry, but it is just awkward and it's, weird. It's, and that's most of the sexual tension situations throughout the episode are just kind of awkward and strange there's three big moments in the episode where they have these physical encounters with one another the first is right. in that office the second is on the train right when they're inadvertently posing inadvertently. as a newlywed couple <laughs> oddly called mr and mrs brown for some reason yeah, right <laughs> right <laughs> And then at the end, when they see each other in that cabin, and she starts trying to rip his ear off with her teeth, I guess. I mean, it's a very <laughs> aggressive little dance that they have. It is not erotic no. by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm still watching it, and I'm looking at Maria Bell, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'd hit it. <laughs> so 
<laughs> just the sex appeal they're going for never quite materializes. And it's not one of those things that's going to develop over the course of a series either. Well, I, certainly not when you only have nine hours to do it. <laughs> well, I mean, that's why I'm thinking when this no. thing aired, people must have been really worried. The writing was probably immediately on the wall. It would have to have been. When you watch this, this looks like a pilot that wasn't ordered to series. I look at this and I'm like, this is a one-off. We're never going to see this again. If somebody told me that, I would not have been surprised. Yeah. But evidently they got a whole season-ish thing out of it. And I cannot believe it. Like, I just can't believe that that worked out. There are so many things. I mean, it starts with chemistry between the two leads not really coming together. But there's just virtually nothing about this quite works. Yeah. The dialogue is weird. The character names are weird. Like, I understand Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Okay, so we don't know their real names and stuff. Mr. Smith's partner is named Scooby, which is dumb. And Maria Bellows, Mrs. Smith, notes that it's dumb at one point. We've got Mr. Big. It took me like half the episode to figure out what the bad guy's names were. But their it's names... Just like Russell. <laughs> fucking Russell and... <laughs> Who's the other one? Ralph. The bad guy's <laughs> names are Ralph and Russell. Could you get less threatening than that? <laughs> it is wild. Yeah. Okay, I think we derailed the story. Where were we? Okay. Sure. She ends up knocking him unconscious as they try to, like, fudge their way out and avoid the security guard. With about there. the weakest tap to the head I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. She pistol whips him but couldn't have moved that gun more than three inches, honestly. It's this kind of thing. It's like that's the impact that the show has. Right. About it's as like a soft tap that... on the head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we cut to the factory, which is the organization or the, the setting, I don't know, that Mr. Smith works for, where Mr. Big is in charge of uh, leasing Mr. Smith's services out to people who need protection or companies that need to be protected. <laughs> we meet Mr. Smith's partner. Here's your guy. Timothy Oliphant in his acting debut. Right? As Scooby. In fact, I wrote in the notes, holy shit, it's Timothy Oliphant. <laughs> yeah. I had to go back and check because, of course, we're watching this on YouTube in, like, this grainy fashion and i was kind of started it on my phone yeah in the dark and it was great i was like holy shit is that timothy oliphant he occasionally looks like denny from the room and then at other times he looks like that character from clerks 2 that's working <laughs> in the movies with them the weird oh teenage kid he's the type of fella that walks under a flock of birds and is surprised when he ends up with shit on his face because of the grainy nature of the of the the scan on YouTube, but it's definitely Timothy Oliphant, everybody. I want don't you know it's Mr. Justified himself. Oh man, he's my one man crush. Yeah, well, I've got I mean, a couple, but he's definitely one of them. Why wouldn't he be? Well, I can tell you one reason he wouldn't be, and that would be if this was the only thing you ever saw him in. <laughs> well, see, when you were saying that Maria Bello is the only one that knew what she was doing in there. Mm. I was ready to push back because of Timothy Oliphant. I knew that's where you were going with that. The reason being is because I don't think that he's bad in this. And as I don't far either. as uh, as far uh, as a first role to ever have gotten, it's not like he just shows up and asks for a stick of gum and leaves. And especially when his arc plays out in this episode. Oh, my boy brought the heat. He actually showed up to make a fucking TV show <laughs> for your very first role, man. I was really impressed, personally. I like him in just about everything I've seen him in, yeah. so I'm not one to complain. But at, at the same time, Scooby. It's bad enough coming up with a new identity every gig, but come on. How about my name? Is that at least okay? Scooby? Yeah. Yeah, Scooby works. <laughs> it was a code name, you know? <laughs> sure. Anyway, he's great. Good looking man, too. Oh, yeah, well, of course, uh, he's a new recruit. He's recently hired here, and he's working with Mr. Smith as a partner. Scooby locates Mrs. Smith. They find where she's staying. They take some provocative pictures of her for really not much of a reason other than to show some leg. Yeah. And then she leaves her apartment, and Bacula goes in, bugs her room, finds a bunch of fake IDs. This all makes sort of sense, even though you'd think she would be better at safeguarding this room. 
if she's a super spy. But then things take a turn. <laughs> <laughs> As he goes and starts <laughs> tasting her lip gloss and smelling her towels. <laughs> and you're like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's really kind of creepy. Every alarm in your head goes off. This guy is like a groomer or something. Stay away from him. Like, this is weird, man. It was really bizarre. I mean, obviously what they're trying to convey is the fact that he's enamored with her. He can't get her out of his head. He can't get her out of his head. And and the taste of her and the Maria Bello of her is more than he can handle. But it is pretty... It's gross. Pretty obscene. And then at the... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> obscene for ni- <laughs> 1996 CBS yeah. uh, obscenity but on the next level though while this is going on what is Scooby trying to talk to him about oh man what was it he's asking whether Mr. Smith can trust him does it uh, bother you that you don't know the real me I mean I'm your partner and a situation could come up where you'd have to Trust me with your life. You don't even know my name, and we're supposed to be partners. Could you really trust me with your life? in retrospect, that seems like a stupid thing to bring up. (laughs) Over the radio, (laughs) during a mission, people are having conversations that need to be had while other things are happening that need to happen, but we don't have time for them, so they're they're happening at the same time. Right. And do you remember what Scott Bakula's response to him is? His response is, we're spies. We live for danger. I have a feeling she might be a little more dangerous than you think. You forget, Scoop? We're spies. We live for danger. And that's where I started (laughs) really keeping track of the dialogue. (laughs) (laughs) It's not. I heard that line, I was like, oof. <laughs> and it doesn't get better from there, folks. No. Uh, but yeah, that's a very unsettling scene, for sure. Now, it sounds like we're probably dumping on Bakula quite a bit for the performance in this episode. But don't fret, because the very next scene, Maria Bello meets with a friend, or Mark. It's not really very clear early on. Her name is Janine LaFay. Julia Miller is the actress portraying Janine LaFay, and she is the worst in this episode. Far and away. But it's it's bad. It's really bad. It's disarmingly bad. I just don't even know what to say about it. (laughs) I don't know. Do you want to talk about it? It's his work. He does not say much to me. I think to protect me, because I know that somehow it is dangerous. And I feel like... Oh, listen to me. Troubling you with my problems when you hardly know me. No, no, Nothing about okay. the performance is remotely convincing. <laughs> and again, props to Maria Bello for being able to carry that scene and get out of it as quickly as possible. Yeah. Wow. Bacula and Bello confront each other as Janine LaFay is hauled off by those two muscly dudes, uh, Russell and uh, <laughs> Randy. What was his name? <laughs> yep. Ralph. <laughs> Ralph, even worse. They give chase. The the soundtrack goes real sax heavy. Steamy. Like, you'd think this show was going to be on the USA Network. In fact, it probably would have been better if it was on USA. Yeah. Like, I'm thinking, like, Silk Stockings, like like that era. That's what it would like to be. That or, like, Burn Silk Stockings was fucking sexy. Yeah, Silk Stockings was sexy. This is not. For sure. (laughs) This is a show, we said earlier, it takes place in Seattle and does not give two shits that it takes place in Seattle. You know what was a great show that takes place in Seattle? What's that? Millennium with Lance Henriksen and Terry O'Quinn. Oh, okay. And that show owned fucking Seattle. Well, there was never a doubt that it took place in Seattle. Well, this episode does take the time to point out that grunge is dead. You like I figure, when in Rome... Hate to break it to you, but the grunge thing? Dead. How come nobody tells me these things? That's true. In 1996. 1996. Was Vitalogy even out yet? The the second Soundgarden album came out in, like, 95. Like, what are you even fucking talking about? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Get out of here. CBS. 
<laughs> my grandparents watch that and they're like, well, oh, thank goodness the grunge is almost gone. <laughs> that's right. You got to know your audience, I guess. I Who guess are they true. really speaking to? So, but so, yeah, this yeah. kidnapping scene, like most things in this episode, it makes little to no sense. Because Ralph and Ryan or Ralph and R- what's Russell, Ra- Ralph and Russell scoop her up and they're carrying her away. All she had to do was scream, and these guys turned and started firing their guns in broad daylight in, like, a bodega. There's a lot of people using guns very haphazardly. Yeah, they just turn around and start shooting. Like, there's no targets there, you know? Who are you even shooting at? And action man Mr. Smith jumps down the stairs and into about the slowest speed chase you'll ever see. Yeah. In fact, he he observes after getting knocked over, Superman, I'm not. Another real great line of dialogue there. Right. It's so hard for him to even say out loud. <laughs> like it's just that kind of line needs something to set it up prior. Right. Where somebody may have implied that you were Superman. <sighs> okay. Superman, I'm not. Right. Like, because... Now, there's one thing I feel I could have saved the end of this scene. Okay. Okay? So, what we're talking about here is Scott Bakula jumps on the side of this car that's driving away with the bad guys inside. Which, on first viewing, I thought they got away with the girl. I did, too! I was going to mention that. I was like, am I an idiot? Didn't... Because then she's just free later. She's just at like... the fucking event later. Like, <laughs> uh, like I was like, what, what, where did you come from? Are you the but same? She... Oh, she's definitely the same lady. She starts talking and I'm like, no, that's her. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they don't get away with her because they're terrible. But imagine being so bad at your job that you kidnap a woman in broad daylight, get her into the car, and then can't figure out how she escaped later. <laughs> it's rough. But the one thing that I thought might save it is because he jumps on the side of the car and the car is pulling away and he's hanging on to it like Dukes of Hazard. Mm-hmm. And then somebody points the gun onto the glass to show, ha, we have a gun. And he just gets spooked and falls off the car. Falls off the car. Yeah. And that's the Superman I'm not. Lying. Yeah. And he just gets spooked because the guy's got a gun on him. And I thought, well... What you need to have happen there is when they're pulling away and he hits the street, the glass needs to shatter with a gunshot that shows he just dodged that. Right. Exactly. But no, he just kind of put the gun in his face and he... And he's like, okay, 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 okay. And fell off. Yeah. <laughs> if he were falling off and then the gunshot went off and the glass exploded, you'd know that there was a reason that he had to drop off the... I don't know. Yeah. No, it, you're totally right. I'm glad you brought up the thing about I thought they kidnapped the girl because <laughs> I thought I was crazy. <laughs> I thought, well, I must have just looked away or I must have just zoned out or something for a second. One note about the soundtrack here. We're kind of like at a halfway point of this episode, even though it feels like nothing's happened <laughs> yet. <Yeah. laughs> the soundtrack is composed by Velton Ray Bunch. You OK, who is that? He composed most of the music for Quantum Leap, Magnum P.I., Oh. Yeah, like, okay. I mean, you know, Mike Post came in and did the themes and stuff, but Felton Ray Bunch did a lot of the score music for individual episodes. And wow. Yeah, so it's the same guy. And Felton Ray Bunch was a protege of Mike Post. So he, he studied oh, okay. under Mike Post and then did this, and he's done a lot of great stuff. This is just kind of, I, I won't even say it's his fault this isn't working. Like, it's just, well, there's such a tonal clash. To do. Yeah, there's you such a tonal I mean? clash with every single thing happening in this show. We can't figure out what we want to be. <laughs> yeah. It definitely feels like it's shooting for, like, silk stockings or, like, burn notice. You yeah. know, something, like, super steamy and sexy and spy action. But it's also, like, maybe trying to be a comedy. Well, obviously, with the Art Deco font at the beginning, the score music, they were thinking of something that had sort of classical kind of vibes to it in terms of, Maybe like a 1950s or 60s aesthetic, Yeah, because right? his tuxedo is white also. Why didn't we just make the show take place in the 50s or 60s, you know? Right, Like, why yeah. do we have to be at odds throughout? Yeah, um, yeah. When he's in that tuxedo later, he's wearing a white coat. That's very yeah. Art Deco also. Yeah. yeah. 
Bello continues to kind of spy on Bacula. Bacula spies on Bello. There's one point at which Bello's stalking him and watches him help a kid repair a bike, which is weird. <laughs> that's just to show that he's a nice guy. Yeah, he's just a nice like, guy. But see, that's not what Spy Man should be. Right. Spy Man should not be stopping to help kids in their bicycles. You know who wouldn't have done that? Daniel Craig. <laughs> I don't mean as a person. I mean as James Bond. <laughs> Hell, Roger Moore wouldn't do that. Oh, I don't. I don't. I think. I think Roger well, Moore would have. Yeah, maybe Roger would have dressed Moore as a bicycle repairman and then done it. <laughs> I did make a note here that when Bacula gets in that mobile command center, I do really mm-hmm. love Timothy Oliphant in this. Now, like I said, my he's opinion great. of him, he starts to kind of wear on me a little bit later in the episode, but he is really doing his best. Here. Yeah. He brought his A game for what it was back then, and his A game is actually pretty good considering it's his first gig. Yeah, that's the part that's pretty amazing. Because normally for your first gig, you get, you know, like a background credit almost. Right. He's a pivotal character. He's, he's a in major this. character in this. Oliphant mentions a Scooby, I should call him, mentions that. No, um, Oliphant's fine. I just keep calling him by their names Oliphant, Bacula, Bello, but Smith, Mrs. Mister, you know, it's, eh, whatever. Uh, Oliphant mentions that Bacula's breath stinks. June of last, don't suppose you found any gum. Breath mint, maybe, in Janine's purse? Gum? Uh, maybe why? Breakfast burrito, man. I know it's not always convenient to brush, but, uh... Sorry. Yeah, that he smells like a breakfast burrito. <laughs> oh, he just asks, you didn't happen to find gum in that lady's purse, did you? Yeah. Like, maybe, why? But this is one of the things I liked about the episode. There's a really good payoff for that moment. Because yeah. when Bello comes to the door of the van and finds him, he grabs a piece of gum before he goes out to talk to her. And I'm right, like, because ah, Scooby that's... already said he's got bad breath. That's good. That is a, that's clever. That's fun. That's a little visual gag there. I feel like they're really going for a moonlighting vibe with these two. You know, that sort of contentious, built up, pent up sexual energy between the two of them. And it's not there. It's not really there. They just keep kind of spying on each other. Yeah. For a while. Now, there is a formal event that evening where this woman, LaFay, uh, Janine LaFay. Yeah, she's the wife of the person that Bacula is hired to find. Yes, Stanley Duke, who works for Dynatech and has, with his partner, developed this new technology. Cold fusion. Yes. His partner is dead. And they're and, trying uh, to keep this guy alive. Right. And he's sort of disappeared, fallen off the grid. So Bacula tries to convince Bella to, to let him into this dance, this event that night. And she's kind of coy about it. He shows up anyway and tries to get in and once again demonstrates just what a bad fucking spy he is. Yeah. <laughs> he is so bad at trying to get into this event. The guy has the list right in front of him. Just look for a fucking name on the list. He keeps just throwing names out there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I spoke with so-and-so and so-and-so. And the guy's like, hmm, not on the list. And it yeah. just kind of goes on like that. And then he's like, well, he's oh, na- there she he, is. Yeah, he's naming off the aliases that he read in her apartment oh, earlier. Oh, okay. All right. I missed so, that. I missed that. But, okay. But yeah, well, I mean, he, he could be forgiven it, for that a little bit. Then You might have gotten it if it had paid off in some sense. But he went through every name and she wasn't going by any of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if they had done some kind of like little like, I don't know, even if it were necessary, a little flashback or something. If he had just chosen the name that he knew that she'd be using right then, that would show that he knew what he was doing. Right. Instead, he just comes off as a... Doofus? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's... Just it, not good at his job. He seems to get in by sheer luck. Yeah. And he, a lot of does. what happens he does, seems to be just sheer luck. <laughs> Did you ever see that show Human Target? I never watched it. I remember the ads for it and what have you, because it's the lawyer guy from another David E. Kelly show. Correct. Human Target, fantastic. Going for a similar vibe. It was really good. The first season of Human Target was really, really good. I didn't watch the second season, but the first season of that show, very, very good. Okay. Uh, Well worth watching. But everything this show manages to not achieve... Human Target achieves pretty handily, and that's why I bring it up. Mark Valley. 
And what was he on before that? He left a show to. He was on Boston that. Legal. Boston he was on Legal. That's right. He was on Fringe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, worth a look. That it was good. Yeah. But back to this. So, our muscly dudes, <laughs> Ralph and Russell. Ralph and Russell are there <laughs> at this party. Stanley and Janine run off, and they get on a bus and. We've talked about some cringeworthy moments <laughs> in this episode so far, and I think that it's tough to top the towel smelling <laughs> from earlier, but by God, this show's going to go for it. Scott Bakula, in a real Marty McFly kind of moment, oh, goes up to some cool street kids, borrows a skateboard, and uses this little dart cord cable thing to hook onto the back of an extraordinarily slow moving bus and <laughs> skateboard behind it like he's skiing yeah uh now did you notice when he takes the skateboard from the kid he doesn't just take it from him he pays him for it yes <laughs> he <laughs> he like i went back i watched it. he hands him some money and says Emergency bus inspector. Emergency bus inspection. What? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> In his tuxedo, he grabs this kid's skateboard and says, Emergency bus inspection. Pardon me, emergency bus inspector. Terrible. Oh my god, it's so awful. Like, what? What like, a terrible line. <laughs> <laughs> emergency bus inspector. <laughs> what a cool spy. <laughs> Emergency bus inspection. Yeah, and then shoots this line into the back of the bus and holds on for dear life. Meanwhile, a real spy, Maria Bello, shows up on a motorbike. Fucking motorcycle. <laughs> comes down a staircase, extends a leg out, and taps one of the bad guys with it. And he falls to the ground, completely fucking immobilized. Like, no movement. <laughs> I'm like, that dude might be dead. <laughs> Yep, he's done. <laughs> that guy's done. But so Bacula's just kind of hanging on while this bus goes down, and he's like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah, dodging there's these There's a cars. lot of that. <laughs> and then he finally face plants into the windshield of this other guy's car. Yeah. You know, and it's like, guess a comedic beat. It's cartoony, like his face is all mashed up against the window. This is and the second he... windshield he's had his face mashed up against in this episode. <laughs> and then when he gets out, the guy just beats the shit out of him. <laughs> <laughs> like, for, like, what? This yeah. is just rando guy on the Seattle street. <laughs> Gets out of his four-door sedan and beats the shit out of Super Spy. Do you remember that moment in Being John Malkovich where Malkovich is on the side of the New Jersey (laughs) Turnpike and that guy in that truck leans out and just throws that can at his head? (laughs) Hey, Malkovich, think fast! And that's it. It's got the similar vibe. It's like, what was the purpose for that? What did you do that for? (laughs) Yeah. And then so she has to come back and save him. So she goes back and, like, knocks out random guy and he hops on the back of her motorcycle and they chase after the bus and it was just so bad yeah so bad like painfully bad emergency bus inspection (laughs) emergency bus inspector they figure out where stanley and janine are headed to this cabin because of her expired fishing license or something no because she was carrying a tube (laughs) (laughs) That one would use to carry a fishing rod in. So she oh, must yeah, be going actually, somewhere to fish. Yeah, that actually led to one of the lines I did like. Great. And all we got to do is search every fishing hole in the country. I love it. Yeah, it, that was pretty clever. <laughs> Even if the way we got there was like, come on. Yeah. We next see Bakula trying to get on a train, which is all booked up. There's no room on the train. And he's sitting there trying to coerce his way on there again you would expect a spy to be better at this i don't think you understand you see i have to be on that train i do understand mr smith there's nothing i can do the train is full that <laughs> uh meanwhile right like the spy would be like a conductor on the train or something right scooby is nearby shining shoes and he just boosts a ticket from somebody? Like, he's already better at this than Bacula is. <laughs> yeah. 
But I'm right, also like, how he's long were you there? How long were you there? Are you even sure this guy's on the right fucking train? Like, how did you do this? <laughs> Passes the ticket off to Bakula. Bakula gets on the train. This man he stole the ticket from has a wife. Just and we happens. see him and the wife. The wife is like, what happened to the ticket? He's like, I don't know. I just had it here. And then we get on the train. Bakula is shown to the car where he's at. And Maria Bello's in there. Did she steal the wife's ticket? Yeah. Yeah, she did. Jesus Christ, why did you do that to these people? <laughs> While they were looking for his ticket, you see her hand reach in and steal she the stole. woman's ticket out of her bag. These poor people. Yeah. They just wanted to go on their honeymoon to some kind of weird cabin, I guess. That's where this train goes. <laughs> Too bad Man. it's not the two characters from Honeymoon Express. That would have been fun. Oh, that would have been good. <laughs> so I said, when they see each other in that bed chamber or whatever, that sleeping car... They sexually disarm each other is what I what I refer sort to of? It as. They they kind of yeah. feel around each other's legs a little bit and thighs, pull out some guns and throw them out the window. Throw them out the window, which seems like a bad move <laughs> long term. But even that doesn't get your motor running, if you know what I mean. No, they start making out and then that porter comes in. They just keep making out in front of him and then he leaves and then they just keep making out. It's like, oh, they want to be making out with each other. <laughs> but it still doesn't, it still still feels like, uh, is this force? Is this part of the gig? Like, what are they doing here? <laughs> the implication that Scooby has made regarding Mrs. Smith is that she is like an all-star assassin. And now... Which I bought because... At the time of watching this, I believed this to be some kind of source material from which the other things were lifted. Like, I didn't right. realize this stuff till after the fact that they're completely unrelated. Okay. <laughs> because these three popular properties all have the exact same name and have such similar premises. It's just amazing. Yeah. It's more than just parallel thought. It's like... I think the new Amazon series is a reboot of sorts of the movie. Like, I think it's recognizing that it comes from the movie. Yes. There are elements there. But this is completely just nine years prior. And... This has this has way more in common with shows like Heart to Heart or Moonlighting, stuff like that. Yeah. That's where this show came from. Right. But the Mr. and Mrs. Smith thing, so at the time... This is will they or won't thinking, they make out. It's not will they or won't they kill each other. That's not the game we're playing. Right, here. right. And well, at the time, like I said, I was thinking that this was coming from the same source material that the 2005 movie did. Yes. So when they were implying that she was an assassin, I was like, oh, well, maybe she's, you know, network TV assassin. Right. I bought it. I thought that's what was going on, but it's a misdirect. Yeah, I definitely think I did, too. And I, what I didn't expect was for the pilot to commit. And there's a moment towards the end that I thought, oh, this is setting it up to be very, very interesting. Where, like, nobody trusts anybody. Yeah. But then, of course, it immediately resolves it. And we end <laughs> up with our by-the-books standard-setting pilot. But not to get too far ahead of it here. This part's kind of funny. Bacula loses Bello on the train and sees Frank in the hallway. Frank, have you seen my wife? And Frank's response is, no, but if you had an argument, maybe you should kiss and make up. More champagne? And I was like, God, this dialogue's so terrible. Like, <laughs> it's like, it's all just like, what's the most obvious thing I could have all of these characters say at every given turn? Yeah. But, you know, obviously he walked in on them and they were making out and he was just like, okay, you guys, you know, you just keep making out. That's cute. But his delivery of it really doesn't make it seem like it's a joke referring back to that. It's like he would tell anybody this. <laughs> you know, regardless of context. So Bakula and Scooby get to this lake. There's a cabin there. Yeah, because there. the train at the end of the day was nothing but a, like a false lead. Like it didn't right. have anything to do. With, it's, it's almost like we just, hey, we've got this train for the day. We should <laughs> shoot some stuff on the train. <laughs> yeah. You People know, like it's... trains. Spy movies need trains. North yeah, by Northwest had a train. Right. So Bakula gets to the lake, and the implication I felt was that Bello had followed him there, but she seems to have gotten there before him. And the reason I say that is because she emerges from the lake in scuba gear. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, she knew where they were going because she had like high powered microphone pointed at their van. Okay. 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 So when they determined where they were going to go, which they already said they thought was a long shot. She mm. took it as gospel, I guess. She just went all in. She rented the scuba gear, for God's sake. And the scuba gear is funny, because I think it is just an excuse to get her into a wetsuit for the rest of the episode. Probably, yeah. That sort of one-piece body stocking is typical female spy gear, like 1960s female spy gear. And they're like, wetsuit? Eh, close enough. Close you know, enough. Cram her yeah. into that thing and have her run around for a little bit. And, again, she looks great in it. <laughs> This is when the two of them have that wrestling match in the cabin where she's trying to eat his ear. And there's music that sounds like you ended up at a cover band from Miami Sound Machine. Like it's a Miami Sound Machine cover band. It does not fit at all. It's so bizarre. Stanley and Janine are both at the cabin. They kind of talk with them like, no, we're here to help you. We want to help you get away. Russell and Ralph show up and just fucking blow up the whole goddamn cabin. Like, they they (laughs) nuke the fucking cabin. Right. And this is weird because the cabin blows up. They obviously paid the money to have this building explode. And they have a couple shots of the characters running from the cabin as it explodes behind them. But the way the shots are framed, you barely see the cabin exploding. Like, it's a tight (laughs) shot on them. It's not a wide shot of them running away. It's tight. Maybe a quarter of the screen, you can see the cabin. And I'm like, you paid all this money to blow up a cabin. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, get a shot of the cabin. Like, get a dramatic wide shot of that shit. Of them running from it. I mean, maybe it was edited that way because something didn't come out. That's possible. Maybe the whole cabin didn't blow up. Or, yeah, something like that. But you're right. It's obviously a dramatic moment that's very obscured the way it's directed. There is one by design way to shoot that. That shot is supposed to look a certain way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And when it doesn't, you're just kind of watching this and you're like, oh, man, they blew up the cabin, but you couldn't even see it. Bakula gets to use a cool gadget offensively when he takes down one of the bad guys with like a pen dart shooter thing. Right. At this point, it's just shoot out in the woods situation. And the bad guys kind of explaining their plan and the reason they wanted to kill this scientist guy is because yeah. the oil companies make so much money for everybody that cold fusion could ruin it for everyone. And nobody wants that. Right. And because the factory is usually in favor of corporate interests, this statement at the end is supposed to sort of like, see, this is in your best interest too, Scott Bakula. We are the same, you and I. We Perhaps are the in same, another you world, and I. we could have been friends. <laughs> but it's a real balance of terror situation here between, <laughs> you know, has Mr. Smith met his match in Ralph? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Cold fusion is somehow going to be bad for America. Right. It's so bizarre. You know, I think now that you've said that out loud, I think that would be easier to sell in a CBS show today than it would have been in the mid-90s, actually. Probably. You know, CBS's audience is probably like, oh, yes, we can't have that. Yeah. Those, (laughs) yeah. So the villains are dispatched, but now we have the problem of somebody's a rat. Because how did the villains find them? They were the only three people who knew. So somebody's a rat. So Bello pulls a gun on Scoot. I'll kill four of you before you even clear your weapons, and I'll take my chances with the other two. And you see this star? That's going to make it legal. And this is the point at which I'm like, ooh, this standoff thing is the best thing about the whole episode. This is the moment where I'm like, oh, this could go somewhere really interesting if these three have to now work together and nobody trusts anyone. Yeah. But that's not what happens. We find out very quickly that that Scoob is a rat. But he does mention that Scoob survived, I think. And he was... Yeah. yeah, He survived it. And Scooby also says to Mr. Smith, David, my real name is David. The human moment the two of them share. As he's quote-unquote dying. Right. Yeah. But not really. Yeah. 
So they're trying to do something. That whole scene in a better show would have been great. But here it's just, now what are we doing? (laughs) (laughs) It's also really interesting because an audience watching this in 1996 would have looked at that and been like, yeah, but who's that guy? That guy's nobody. Timothy Oliphant? Of course he's going to get killed. We're looking at it with the hindsight of Timothy Oliphant. And, oh, there's no way they fucking kill Timothy Oliphant. There's no way he's like this crooked character. He's definitely on the show, right? Right? You know? How do you pass up this actor? So uh, so it's kind of interesting. But that's like the one best part of the whole show, I think. Oliphant sells it, you know? Yeah. He's playing the character that's, oh, come on, man. What are you talking about? She's out of her mind. You got to believe me. He's playing the guy in the chair character. Pretty good job with it overall, I think. Yeah. You know, Scooby is dispatched at the end. Mr. Big says, don't worry, we've got you a new partner. One that's been thoroughly vetted. Thoroughly vetted, thoroughly checked out. Folks, can you guess who this new partner might be (laughs) that he's about to meet on the Space Needle? (laughs) Because it's Seattle. Yeah. You know, there's a lot about me you're never going to know. Same here. You going to be okay with this, working together? Yeah. I think so. Good. Then let's get started. Of course it is. Because that's where the title of the show comes from. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, together. Now they're both working for the factory. The factory is actually kind of a neat name I like that. for this kind of thing. Because it's though. nondescript. Yeah. There's something about it that feels like it is just cranking out spies. There's something that makes it feel like you are replaceable. Right. This is a factory. And we do this job and you will either do it and live or you will die and we will replace you. In a different show? Yeah. 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 So all in all, I guess you could say that you know what they were trying to do, but I'm not even sure about that. Mm -hmm. Because what I think you're leaning towards is that they're like going for like a moonlighting kind of heart to heart situation. And I agree with you there. But with all this uh, Art Deco aesthetic that we were talking about also, somebody had a vision in their mind that they know was not fully realized. (laughs) You're right. You're absolutely right. But at the same time, if that version of the show existed, who would the audience for that have been in 1996? Yeah. I don't feel like neo-noir kind of stuff was hitting, right? Most of the Hollywood noir movies that were throwbacks Mm -hmm. were modern noir movies, like Lone Star or something like that. Every once in a while you get something like L.A. Confidential that is this pure throwback to the 40s aesthetic. But I just wonder who that show would have been for as far as a far as a broad audience in 1996 yeah it was not leaning into that though no. i mean the things that were speaking to that were one the credits the credits and, and the, the music those are the two things the credits and the music and the fact that scott bacula's character seems to me to be very much a Cary grant-esque character yeah i guess i'm not really sure what he was going for there's so much sam beckett coming through they're on foot they, they can't have gone far Maybe we should go back and, and look. We are not going anywhere. Why? We were just starting to click. <laughs> click? You call this clicking? Yeah, sort of. I mean, clicking is a subjective term, but I... Are you crazy? Don't you get it? If it weren't for you, I'd have Stanley and Janine right now. So what are you doing here? Good question. Won't happen again. And I yeah. don't think it's just me seeing Sam Beckett, because I watched three seasons of Enterprise, like you said, And I've seen him in other things, too, like his two major movies, Necessary Roughness and Major League Three. Right. I've seen Scott Bakula do other things. But this one just, I don't know, maybe it's just not that far removed from Sam Beckett or what. Well, here's something that I thought about watching it. And that's that, and I haven't seen anything other than the pilot, but other episodes in season I started one watching the second one have him assuming a role in suburbia have them mm-hmm. assuming roles as maybe musicians or things like that and i'm looking at that and if that's what we're doing week to week is that they're infiltrating a place and taking on different roles that is a very quantum leap adjacent kind of idea 
Right. It's like he has to go in and embody this different person for a week. But it's not quite the same thing at all because the person he's embodying doesn't really technically exist right (laughs) right no but you're not wrong because i went back and actually read that den of geek interview and article on it and that was one of the things that drew him to doing this was the idea that if i'm going to do a weekly television show i want it to spread my wings enough that i'm doing different things each week Uh, see it's that quantum leap you get it in your blood and you can't let it go he wanted it to be able to deliver that same thing that quantum leap and did, look at which how is like not become stale yeah we talk about the range the level of talent that went into quantum leap for him sure he got to stretch his comedic chops his dramatic chops he got to sing everything he got to be a pure renaissance man on quantum leap why wouldn't you want that to be the standard right yeah yeah except here it's like ah, you know dean i love you but I'm kind of wishing you were an attractive blonde woman. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, I understand. <laughs> she really seemed to be the only one that knew what show they were trying to make. Yeah. Or either that or she was trying to make a different show than everybody else. I, I, to be fair, I may have fallen for her charm. I don't know that she was that good in the show. <laughs> I just know that <laughs> I found her to be the most appealing part of the show for me. I don't know if she necessarily gave a great performance in relation to what everybody else was doing because she and Bacula don't fit. I don't know. It, all the pieces don't seem to quite fit together as a puzzle. Right. The picture does not come fully realized. So anyway, like we said, guys, make sure you go to YouTube and check this out. (laughs) I think it's worth it. It's definitely worth it. Again, for Scott Bacula completists out there, you loved him on quantum leap. You loved him on enterprise. You loved him in Major League Three. Check this out. Probably, <laughs> Nobody loved him in Major League you probably Three. probably haven't seen it before. <laughs> and it is such a just weird time capsule oddity from the mid-90s. It's definitely a slice of 96 for sure. And if you but, really yeah. like Seattle, maybe you should go watch some episodes of Millennium. <laughs> a far superior you- show that takes place in Seattle. Uh, God. Well, folks, thanks as always for listening. Remember to subscribe to the feed so you never miss an episode. And be sure to review the show. Tell your mom that we talked about a CBS series this week. She might be into that. Tell your quantum leap. My mother-in-law loves all the NCIS. Oh, well, there you go. Um, We're also available on YouTube in an audio format. So you can like, comment, and subscribe there. You can send us funny gifts at oboyqlpod at gmail.com you can also look for us on social media i am captain burn c-a-p-t-n-b-e-r-n on blue sky and brian.lee.martin on instagram and threads and i am at action nate on both blue sky and threads and uh folks that's a wrap for this one we'll see you next time for our 50th episode oh my god um we've done this 50 times yeah somehow Wow. Until then, I'm Brian. And I'm Nate. And we'll be here in the waiting room. I'm Mr. Smith, but that's not my real name. I'm Mr. Smith, but that's not my real name either. You see, we're spies. Basic is a name thing. Couldn't it get a little confusing? People might think we're married. That's okay. As long as you don't. <laughs>